Today, I want to tell you about a journey that I've been on for most of my life. Ever since I was a kid, I've heard tales of Bigfoot and wild men while spending time with my friends and family. As I grew older and read more about the paranormal, my interest in cryptids and other things strange only deepened. That's why I'm so excited to share with you what I've personally become involved with, the Untold Radio Network. The Untold Radio Network is a live streaming podcast network that airs a new show every day across all podcast platforms, YouTube, and more. They have eight different shows on all sorts of exciting topics, such as Bigfoot, cryptids, UFOs, aliens, and much more. I even have my own show called Weird Encounters, where I talk about all things strange. This is more than just a podcast network. It's a community that allows me to meet so many amazing people who share their stories and experiences with the strange. If you're interested in hearing more of these stories and learning more about the paranormal and cryptids, make sure you check out the Untold Radio Network for all kinds of exciting shows. It's free to subscribe, so what are you waiting for? Visit www.untoldradionetwork.com today. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and Nate was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? It was. It was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sure. See ya. Hello. Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. title of this episode, Further Adventures in the Land Called X, is, I will admit, somewhat misleading. It is indeed a furthering of the accounts of experiences members of the North American Wood Ape Conservancy have had as they conducted their work this past summer in a remarkable little corner of the Washington Mountain Range. It is, as you probably already know, called X by the group, you will hear some astonishing things. Possibly you will find some of these things to be unbelievable. As always, you have my assurances that everything you hear is true. I know these guys. Crazy as some of them may sound, this is true. But no, the show is not actually about random Bigfoot encounters and X. It's actually about a group of dedicated individuals going about the work they feel is necessary to bring Bigfoot out into the light of science and reality. Members of the NAWAC have not been shy about their intention to collect as complete a wood specimen as possible. However, this is the first time you'll hear about what that endeavor is actually like. It's not, as you'd probably expect, easy work. Now, you either agree with the point of view of the NAWAC or you don't. Regardless, the position of the group and the thing that drives them can be summed up by explaining what's called the 5500 rule of conservation biology. Basically, about 50 individuals of a particular animal need to be present in any given area to prevent a destructive rate of inbreeding. If these 50 are cut off from more of their kind or the last of their kind, their chances of survival are questionable. Around 500 individuals are required to maintain an acceptable level of genetic variation. Numbers lower than that can make the animal susceptible to being sucked into the terrifyingly named extinction vortex. The extinction vortex is a series of models used by biologists to understand and predict animal extinction rates. Besides genetic diversity, other factors include habitat pressures and habitat fragmentation. Of course, no one knows for sure how many apes there are in the Washitas, or North America for that matter, but we know that the region has been and continues to be harvested of trees using practices to promote the development of monoculture forests. We know that the relatively untouched areas of the range are becoming fewer and farther between. When applying that knowledge to what we understand about large primates worldwide, and the group's own observations of what ape behavior over the past several years, we would expect Bigfoot to be social animals that live in groups inhabiting established territories. Each group, whatever its social structure, would require a finite amount of land upon which to thrive. Some of the big unknowns is how big is that territory? Are monoculture environments acceptable wood ate habitat? How many eligible areas are left in that part of the country? In short, are there less than 50 apes left? 
or more than 500? And do they know where they can find more of their kind? Essentially, how many factors found in the extinction vortex are already at work and affecting wood ape populations? The NAWAC feels the only way to know how many X's there are in the Washita's or the Ozarks or the Sierras or the Olympics or anywhere is to put qualified and numerous boots on the ground to find out. The only way to put those boots on the ground is to establish as an absolute fact that there's an actual animal to be protected. The most efficient and expeditious way to establish as an absolute fact that the animal exists is to collect a specimen. There are more than a few people in the community of Sasquatch enthusiasts who feel the best course is to leave these animals alone. They've been just fine all by themselves so far, and they'll be just fine in the future. But that train of thought is tantamount to putting a bag over your head as a way to better understand the world around you. All one has to do is look at a satellite map of any wild and woolly area in North America to see how truly wild and secluded parts of it are under constant pressure. They're shrinking. If you think the situation is tolerable to an animal like Sasquatch, you might as well ask yourself how many can be balanced on the head of a pin. I suppose we could wait for an acceptable DNA sample to be collected and confirmed, or for an unsuspecting Bigfoot to step in front of a logging truck with bad brakes, or for an old portly one to succumb to cardiovascular disease while raiding a campground dumpster. But nothing like that has happened in more than 50 years of looking, and, at least in my opinion, it's unlikely to happen in the near future. So we can either keep waiting and hoping to get lucky and pretending like the animal we're talking about here has all the time in the world, or we can show some initiative and try to protect them in their habitat sooner, perhaps tomorrow. And that's what the NAWAC is working towards today. What follows is a series of interviews I conducted at the recently concluded NAWAC member retreat. First up, you'll hear from Alton Higgins and Daryl Collier, the group's chairman and field operations coordinator, respectively. Then you'll hear from Paul Bowman as he relates his experiences surrounding a daylight sighting of a probable wood ape. Then it'll be Brad McAndrews and Jordan Horseman talking about their time in a hunting blind, the group calls Overwatch. Finally, we'll hear from Travis Lawrence. He's the man who's come the closest of all within the NAWAC. Gentlemen, here we are again, almost a little more than a year later than we were last year. Same room, though, talking about the NAWAC's now annual retreat. Alton, what's the point of this event for us as an organization? The point is to decompress, to discuss, to plan, strategize, just to have a good time with each other. I think one of the great strengths of our group is that we like each other. Yeah, I think it's very important for us to get together like this and visit. Daryl, you gave a presentation today, the recap of the recently concluded operation. Can, can you give us some highlights? Just what are some of the things that were of note in your mind? As with last year, we went over what we call 19 quantitative events. Those are things that we track, uh, behavioral things that we track. There seemed to be a sense, at least I had the sense, that some of our investigators had this notion that perhaps there was a de-escalation. The data that we compiled for today's retreat clearly indicates that there's nothing of the sort going on. It, in fact, what we're witnessing, a continual escalation of, of behavior, more rock throwing, more wood knocking, the visuals, it just continues. It's just on an upward trajectory over the last three years. And it's truly incredible. If I were not a part of this organization, it would be very difficult for me to believe. And so I understand anybody's skepticism about all this. I truly do. One of the reasons we haven't, what they would say, normalized the data, we've spent a lot more time. If you compare Operation Endurance, which was the first sort of long-term operation versus Operation Relentless, how many days were we in there this year for Relentless? Operation Relentless was in total 107 days long. Yeah, it was 83 days, three consecutive days before we had a small gap between two teams. We were there for 83 days without cessation. And I think there was a, a gap of two days, maybe one day. We had another team for a couple of days, and then we went for two weeks. But in total, Operation Relentless, this summer's prolonged field study was 107 days with 17 field teams. We were joking because we were talking about the roots of these long-term operations. And when endurance was first proposed, it was a 30-day operation. We were like, how are we going to pull off 30 days? We just did 107, which absolutely blows my mind. Do you know how many members that is over the 17? Do you have any idea? I think we're talking about 35. And of course, some of us were on uh, several teams, but it was absolutely a, a team effort. And it's a great testament to the cohesion of the North American Wood Ape Conservancy and the dedication of these people. That they take time off from work, their families, and they come out and they spend weeks out here. And it's 
a very inhospitable environment researching this thing. And my hat's off to every last one of them. Two of the things we did this year that were different from previous years is we invested a lot in technology. Let's talk about the first piece of technology, which is the security system. Alton, why did we invest in this thing and what did you think we would get out of it this year? We were hoping to get some video footage. We installed a system at pretty considerable expense that that basically had, I think, nine cameras and a, and a 360 degree view uh, around the uh, the cabin. It was all recorded to a a DVR whenever the system was running. So that was our objective because the previous years we've had experiences where the creatures came into close range either to slap the building or to do what they called the rock rain or something like that where, um, yeah, coming up to windows, yeah, the rock rain thing was played for us today. Parts of it, some of the recordings that they had of that are pretty remarkable. You can hear rocks hitting the building just by the hundreds and... Whoa, whoa, okay. I'm just going to interrupt Alan here for a second because some of you may not know what the rain of rocks is that he's talking about. I've actually put this in the show before, but since he's talking about it again, I will intercut a couple of minutes of this bizarre behavior. Now, some people will say, oh, you hear the rocks coming down. Why don't you jump out of bed and run outside and see what's throwing them? And I say jump out of bed because they almost always happen very early in the morning. And the reason we don't do that is we have tried that actually. You get up out of bed, You step on the floor and the cabin is old and creaky. Amazingly enough, as soon as you start moving around, the rocks stop. When you go outside, there's nothing to see. So when this was recorded, we actually specifically did not get out of bed because we wanted to hear what would happen. We wanted to hear the rocks and we wanted to hear how long they would go. There's a little bit of that you're going to hear, and then we'll jump back into Alton mid-sentence. We thought, you have to be close to throw little rocks like that, or nuts or whatever it was that they were throwing, and these other coming up to the windows and looking in the windows and beating on the building. It was all entail close approaches. So we thought, let's put up the security system so we can get video of them, document them approaching the cabin. So that was the idea. That was a good plan. How did it work out, Daryl? Huge disappointment. And that's an understatement. We were very disappointed. We, we thought there might be some problems with it. We discussed that. Absolutely. Brian, you and I had dis- discussed the possibility of whether it would work. We thought we had an obligation to try it. Alton said nine cameras, nine high dollar cameras, surveillance cameras, infrared. They could see in a complete darkness out to 100 feet with a DVR system powered by eight bulldozer batteries with solar panels, a number like half dozen solar panels. As you and I discussed, it was something we had to try. We were obligated to try it. Because as Alton said, we had things coming up to the cabin. People are asking, why can't you get photographs, footage? Okay. We invested heavily in this system. We deployed it. You and I had some reservations. We, we, we had our history with game cameras. We know that game cameras and these things, there's some sort of inverse relationship. They, for whatever reason, avoid them. They don't like them. So we thought there might be something like that along with these surveillance cameras. As it turns out, I think our intuition was correct. We got no footage of any wood apes, none, during Operation Relentless. It seemed like whenever we turned the system on, and each camera, when you turn it on, 
you can see there's like a small red little light. Yeah, it's the infrared. And so if their visual acuity is heightened even 50% higher than ours, then you know they're going to be able to see that red light. And it got to the point where we started to view the security system as a wood ape shield. If we turned it on, we would perceive a, a marked difference in behavior and, and we could turn the, the cameras on because we had guys in there by themselves. When they felt that they were being a little encroached upon, they would flip on the system and, and that would solve the problem. Our thinking at this point is something to do with the fact that the IR is not invisible. I think Kathy Strain posited that perhaps it's even blinding to them. If, if they can see so much better than we can, if their eyes are so much better, they bring in so much more light. And who knows, maybe these things are just like bright beacons to them. Well, whatever reason, I think it's discernible. I think there was no doubt in most of our minds that with those cameras going, that behavior would just cease. So we got to work. We stopped ran, running it. We just turned it off. We left it off and everything went through the roof. Because you're given the choice between having a security system, a surveillance system that could record endless hours of trees versus getting the animal to come in close as it has been in the past. We chose the interaction. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Spent a lot of money on it. We were obligated to try it. We did try it. Very, very much a disappointing system. So we're now, we're going to get rid of it. Basically, it's, it's an asset. So we're going to basically recycle it into another asset, which kind of gets us to the reason why if, if the surveillance system was in fact keeping the wildlife away, the reason we wanted them to get close was the second piece of significant investment that we made last year, which was what? Well, we bought some thermal equipment, some thermal optics, rifle scopes, handheld thermal scopes, which significantly upped our game. Connected with that, we devised a way to observe during the night and remain totally hidden. We constructed a tent out of black plastic trash bags. Thermal optics will see through thin layers of black plastic trash bags like they're not there. We took a canopy tent that had a roof to it and had four legs. And then around the walls, we used duct tape and we put black plastic trash bags all around the walls. And then two of our guys would go in there overnight and conduct what we call overwatch. We call it the overwatch tent. The environment in there, so the, the idea is that there's it just this it's black tent. And, and our, our assumption was that wood apes would, would view that as any other tent, any other sort of temporary structure. Now, when you're inside, talk to me about what it's like inside the Overwatch tent while you're performing the duty of Overwatch, because it's not the friendliest environment in the world. Actually, I think it takes a certain mentality because it's very claustrophobic. You can't see unless you hold the thermal up to your eye or the rifle with the thermal scope on it. You can't see. It's four walls, black walls. And so it can be, if you let it get to you mentally, it can be very debilitating, claustrophobic. It can make some people a little crazy. Other people who can maintain that mental discipline, for me, it was not a problem. For Travis, it wasn't a problem. For McAndrews, it wasn't a problem for us. It was just like throwing a fish in a fishbowl and letting him swim. We loved it. And we just ate that stuff up. We'd get in there and we'd spend hours at a time and just eating it up because nothing new you were watching. You were sitting in this Overwatch tent with these thermal optics, watching everything. We actually observed quite a bit of wildlife, not the wildlife we were hoping all the time, but we saw all kinds of animals. There was one particular animal early on that we saw that we were very surprised about. You know what I'm talking about? It went under the cabin? Yeah, the duck. Yeah, I saw it. I saw the duck. Yeah, I heard the quacks. And then Travis, he was my Overwatch partner. He, yeah, he saw the duck under the porch. And then the Overwatch tent was set up so that it could provide Overwatch for the cabin or our base camp cabin. And so, yeah, so we had eyes on the cabin 24-7. And so you got two guys in this Overwatch tent, and the rest of your team is in the cabin sleeping. Are there in tents, regular tents? And so we've got a history knowing that these things approach tents, they approach the cabin. That's what Overwatch was built for, and it was extremely successful. We did see the target species a number of times while we were on Overwatch, and very fascinating. I still believe... Overwatch and thermal optics mounted on rifles. I believe that is the ticket that will eventually pay off. Came very close to paying off this year. We'll talk about that a little later. And I'm going to talk to Travis. Who, he's the one who had the experience you're talking about. So Alton, you were part of the very last team in this year's operation. You and Daryl were the first to arrive for that last team. And the sort of pause between that team and the previous one about two weeks. You guys pulled up at night 
What did you find there in camp? Yeah, we, we pulled up to the property gate, which was locked, and we hiked in to get a key to let ourselves into the camp. As pitch black, we, we first made a little round of the property. We didn't go directly to the cabin, but when we did arrive at the cabin, we saw the overwatch tent basically destroyed. It was just completely broken, smashed flat, pushed over. Daryl said, I thought something like this might happen. It had been a couple of weeks between our arrival and the last team. And last year, we had a similar kind of event happened where we had a, a very large teepee that Paul brought in. And there was a two-week break. That teepee had been there basically all summer. I'd slept a lot of nights in that teepee. Then they came back after two weeks last summer, and the teepee, a lot of the stakes had been pulled up and broken. And I, I didn't see that. I wasn't there for that. But Daryl said, I had a feeling something like this might happen. I find interesting is this structure, the Overwatch tent, it was just put together, but it had been there through an entire Oklahoma summer and there had been storms that had come through. We think at one point there may have been a funnel cloud over the cabin where we are. So there had been heavy rain, there had been heavy wind, and that thing was a trooper the whole time. And you guys come in and it's just, it's flattened. Describe to me the condition of it. It didn't look like it had been blown over. What, what did what did you perceive? What kind of damage did you see on it? That, that, what did you think happened by looking at it? Yeah, it wasn't blown over. It was broken. It looked like it had been pounded from above and then pushed away towards the east. It had been pounded like on the west side. We saw a place where it looked like a large hand had been punched through the side. You could see clear uh, marks that looked like they were fingers and, and a thumb and a large hole that had been pushed down. We found also inside of it a rock that may have been thrown, a, a large rock. The black plastic was stretched out in front of it. And we also saw on top of it what looked to be like possible big money footprints. Oh, smelled a strong smell of a urine. Oh, these damn dirty apes came over and they busted up our tent and then they peed on it. <laughs> Is that what you think happened? That's exactly what I think happened. And I was extremely angry when I saw it. Because last year, like we said, the TP, it was the same time period. Last year when the team came in for Labor Day to finish up Operation Persistence, we found the TP destroyed. The, the, the plastic uh, stakes had been broken in half, many of them, and ripped out of the ground. The tent was about halfway torn down. So going into this year's Labor Day, we, we had another gap of about 10 or 12 days. And so I thought, okay, I'm wondering if they got to that Overwatch tent. And sure enough, when Alton and I walked in there, I looked, it was the first thing I looked at. I said, Alton, look. I remember distinctly, I was, Whoa. I broke out my iPhone and started videoing it, shining my flashlight on it as I was using my phone's video function. So I was recording away and looking at the different broken sections of it and what have you. And then all of a sudden, like a cannon, we heard this huge, loud, bam. And Daryl just, he just went off on the thing. And So what was that bam? What was it? It sounded like a large rock hitting metal. Yeah. yeah. It hit the cabin, or right behind the cabin. There's a metal thing right behind the cabin, so it either hit that or the cabin. It startled us, because we're looking at this Overwatch tent that's been destroyed. We've only been there a few minutes, and then all of a sudden we hear this thing. It sounds like a stick of dynamite going off, and I was already angry. It made me even more angry, because this thing throws a rock, and just, yeah, it got pretty loud at that point, and went after it to the best I could. And of course, you can't chase them. We know that, but still, sometimes you get into it, and you want to chase them. We went to the mountain, shined our lights up there, and looked as best we could. Not too many minutes after that, I still had my camera running, and we heard a, off to the east a real loud thump, a rock hitting the ground, something like that. And so we figured that was uh, related. It was perfectly calm night. There was no wind or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, it was obvious to me that this Overwatch tent was the subject of aggression. There was some frustration, aggression, whatever you want to call it, I think these things took out some frustration and aggression on this Overwatch tent because of some things that had transpired earlier in the summer. That's what I believe. That's speculation. Yeah, I don't have any facts to back it up. And other people might be saying, well, how do you know it wasn't a bear? There were no claw marks, no teeth marks. It wasn't eaten. It wasn't chewed. There was none of that. I mean, and the, and the big hole, it looks like a big human or human-like or ape hand actually punched through. I often talked about how we found a huge rock and it was at least a foot and a half long by a foot wide, this rock was, that had been thrown to the northwest corner of the Overwatch tent. Now, I hadn't been in there because you guys had been in there all summer long, and, and there are smaller rocks in, in the dirt. It's an uneven surface, but not a rock like that. I said all summer, I, I thought that the apes knew that something was up with the Overwatch tent. 
I'm not going to say they knew we were in there up watching them, I don't know, but I think they didn't like it. They would see us go in there. They didn't know what we were doing in there. And some things happened, which you're going to talk about later with Travis and Jordan and some of the other guys and McAndrews, you're going to talk to them. A lot of the key events of Operation Relentless took place because of the Overwatch tent. I think that's key. One of the reasons that we speculated earlier that we had so much more data we had recorded so many more activities such as the wood knocks and the vocalizations and the rocks is because we had guys in the overwatch tent for so much. Some of this could be just that we recorded more data because we were awake more than we had been in the past. So we don't have an overwatch tent anymore. <laughs> so we're going to have to do this all again next year. How, how do you, with, with in relation to the security system, which we've decided now to recycle into other equipment, what, what are we going to do differently next year? I think, as I said, I, I think our mission, our objective is go going to be accomplished through the use of thermal technology and, and overwatch. So that's what we're going to focus on next year. We're going to procure more thermal technology and we're going to construct a better overwatch structure from which to conduct overwatch. In fact, we may even have a mobile overwatch structure as well. Right. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. And we've had this conversation, uh, you and I just personally, but also as a larger group. What I find heartening after this, even though it is the end of a, a long summer and we did not accomplish the objective of, of the organization at this point, it feels to me like it's just a matter of time. We now know how to do it. it, it we figured it out. We know how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. You brought up the phrase in our conversation earlier in the week that you know, we are cracking the code. I love that phrase because I think that is highly appropriate. We are cracking the code. They do use some form of communication, and I'm not talking about verbal communication, but I'm talking about wood knocking and rocks and clicks and pops. And we're figuring that out. Uh, we can't exactly speak it, but we've learned to hear it and identify it. And we are cracking that code. And, and I agree with you. We are very close. So I can't help but believe next year is going to be it for sure. All right. Now I'm with Paul Bowman and Paul had what was probably a daylight visual sighting. Paul, this has been mentioned before. We've not told the story. Can you just tell me what happened? What did you see and how did you find yourself in a spot to see it? I don't exactly remember what time of day. I want to say after lunch, maybe one or two o'clock in the afternoon. It had been a pretty casual day, not a whole lot of activity. Typically, I was wearing my fuzzy slippers and drinking coffee, eating my beanie weenies and wearing my dry socks. We heard this extremely loud impact over to the west cabin. Something hit the sidewall. Immediately, we reacted. Brad McAndrews grabbed his rifle and took off in that direction. So I'm going to check it out. I'm still gearing up, really not in the right mental framework, because this has happened so frequent. Rock impacts just happen all the time, almost to the point of regularity where you just don't react that way. It's like the alarm going off in the firehouse. You don't have to jump up and get your stuff because, you know. Absolutely. I finished off my coffee, and he came back five or ten minutes later. And then at this point, Daryl Collier and Bob Strain decide to go off down there. And so I literally, I think I even said out loud, I said, ah, oh, maybe I ought to put my pants on and go get involved in the game here, suit up. So I geared up and I grabbed my rifle and I walked down the road. And I remember I came around the corner to the clearing and I saw down the road, I saw Bob Strain. He had posted just to the side of the road and he was looking west down the road and he was being still and quiet. And so I thought, okay, so they're on a stock or something. So I thought, I'm going to be sneaky, and I'm going to sneak up on Bob, play a trick on him. So I pulled a little Ricky Recon trick, and I just very quietly and slowly put a stock on Bob, just right in the middle of the road. I wasn't trying to be stealthy or anything. And the point of the matter is it took me several minutes to get over there and close the gap to him. I got probably within maybe, I don't know, five or six yards from him until he finally, I guess he sensed me, and he turned around and he saw me there. And he didn't, he just acknowledged me. And so I closed in behind him. And as he posted and was looking west down the road, I decided to just look down towards the south, towards the creek. A few minutes go by and I see movement walking down probably 75, 80 yards to my south. So I immediately think to myself, okay, there's somebody down there. I've got something to look at now other than foliage. A few seconds go by and I realize there's two large trees at a distance in between those trees is a pretty good clearing. I remember there was sunlight shining down through the canopy. So I thought, oh, okay, whoever this is, it's walking. I'm going to get a good close daylight visual of whoever's walking in my direction. And at this point in your mind, it is a person. It's not whatever was walking. And you're thinking it's one of our guys. 
I, I knew that Daryl was down there. I thought maybe Brad McAndrews had gone with him. I had no idea who was down there. I thought there were multiple team members other than Bob down in the creek area, just investigating, snooping around. And I thought, well, I'm going to get a confirmation here in about a second, and I'll know who it is. Stay tuned for more Sasquatch Odyssey. We'll be right back after these messages. My rifle was slung. My mental framework was not at all prepared to see a wood ape. I can't really explain why. I guess I'd grown complacent, perhaps. I'm known as the group curmudgeon who likes to Monday morning quarterback people that have actually had visuals and had a rifle in their lap. And it's like, why didn't you shoot? So here I am, Arma's paying me back. My rifle slung and I'm just very nonchalant. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, in about a second and a half, I'm going to see who it is. And about that time, this thing walked, and, and keep in mind, it's walking towards me, but at a 45 degree angle towards my right, but it's facing me. It stepped in between those two trees and I immediately realized it wasn't anybody from our team. What first drew my initial interest was when I used to bow hunt, I wore these, it's a ski mask type thing, but it's made of that leafy flage material. It's like a veil. It has a little eye slit and it has a drawstring at your neck so you can cinch it down. But it has this wild leafy kind of material. That's what it looked like it was wearing. And my first thought was, who in the hell is wearing one of those things? Because I don't recall any of our team members actually wearing that. You've described the, the shape and you're doing it in your, with your hands, but no one can see you. It, it's like pointy on top and it goes down at, a, at an angle down to the shoulders. It looked like one of those leafy flage bow hunter veils, but it came to a point at, it was pointed at the top. And what I recall the most is that the outside sort of a halo effect around it was an orange color, like an orange brown, almost like an orangutan type color. And all these pro these thoughts are flooding into my brain as it's happening. I'm thinking, that's really odd. I don't recall. I'm thinking to myself, I don't recall seeing a, a hunter's veil that looks at, like that or looks in that color. And then the pointed, almost a cone-shaped head. That doesn't look right. What I love about this, you're in area X, right? You see a pointy-headed, cinnamon-colored thing off by the creek. You're still not thinking Bigfoot in your head. That's not a monkey. Who, that guy. This is this is what I love about this. And I'll tell you why here in a second, too. And, and as for the rest of it, it looked like it had on one of those Under Armour shirts uh -huh. that it was like a, a solid, maybe an olive drab or a dark or greenish brown color. And then the sleeves looked like camouflage. Except I noticed on the outside edge of the arms, on both arms, it had that almost like a brownish orange halo effect. I only saw it from the waist up. And this thing, its arms were swinging. It was very casual. And I've described it to people, but it looked like, it reminded me almost of Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. He's just diddy bopping back on the block, shuffling back, very casual. But at the same time, very confident, a sense of purpose, a sense of comfort. And all these things, again, in a time frame of about two seconds, are just flooding my brain being furtive it's just walking it's just booking along not running not rushing not sneaking just walking but it almost had a, a cat that ate the canary type of demeanor aha i've got one on you bastard and he's just walking very confidently and casually across this little clearing and then it passed in front of the right hand tree and i couldn't see past the foliage at that point it was totally obscured and I, I think I was in shock. I was like, whoa, what did I just, who did I just see? I leaned over to Bob and I said, Bob, I whispered. I said, Bob, who's down there? And he looks over his shoulder at me. He says, Daryl's down there. And so my brain immediately searching for answers went to Daryl. I thought, okay, it's Daryl. And so I sat there for maybe, I don't know, five or 10 seconds. And I remember thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, Daryl doesn't wear one of those things. That didn't look like Daryl to me at all. Daryl doesn't wear those types of clothes. So then I thought, oh, maybe I just saw a damn wood ape. But here's the problem. And this plagued me for about 12 hours after the, the incident. I literally was expecting all these years and subsequent to that, the last three years because of the sightings of Old Gray, my mind wanted to see Old Gray, wanted to see Patty. I had pre-programmed my brain to think, of a Sasquatch, of a wood ape, to be this massive eight foot tall, very large frame, bulky, Brahma bull on two legs type creature. 
And so Old Grey is this animal that several of us have seen, but it's very large, bigger than Patty, but shaped like Patty, but just gray. And that's what you thought you were going to see. Sort of the classic. Classic, stereotypical characteristics. That's what I was expecting in my mind. And since I didn't see that, my mind could not immediately accept what I thought I'd saw. I couldn't go there. So I immediately started filling in all the blanks, trying to figure out, okay, who was that? What was that? What did I just see? What was the deal? It never dawned on me at the time that, you know, Daryl always carries his rifle with a single point sling, with his weapon at the low ready. He usually wears a boonie hat. None of that stuff really dawned on me. at the time. The, the significance of the weapon, the way he carries it, is his arms would not have been swinging. They would have been holding the weapon. Absolutely. This thing had free-flowing, swinging arms, very casual. Like I said, he was diddy bopping back on the block. Not really a word, but I understand what you mean. That's my word. So I, I thought to myself, okay, if this person continues at that rate of speed on that same trajectory, it's going to end up on the road just past the fifth wheel trailer, probably in about two or three minutes. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get confirmation one way or the other. And, and so I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to know if it was Daryl or not here just real quick. I remember feeling almost a fleeting glimpse of excitement, thinking I may have just seen a wood ape, but I, I couldn't get there yet. About 10 minutes passed and Daryl never showed up. Nothing showed up to, to my west. And all of a sudden, Daryl pops out to the east on the opposite end of the, the fence line of this cabin area. He wasn't wearing his boonie hat. He had a, a, a ball cap on, a camouflage ball cap. But clearly, it was not what I had seen. And then I really got pissed. I got mad because I was like, what the F did I just see? What just happened to me? Why does it not fit all these parameters that I had pre-programmed my brain to, to, to see and to, to process? So Daryl comes over and he's, God, I think I just busted two black ones down by the creek. And I said these words, I said, F that, Daryl, what the hell, where were you just now? Where were you? I was mad, I was angry. Where the F were you? And he's looking at me like, what's your problem? And I said, were you down? And I pointed, were you down there? And he says, yeah, but like 15 minutes ago. And I said, were you coming this direction? He goes, no, I was going. So we went through this whole thing. And he actually went down there and did a reenactment for me. And I told him, he walked down there and I said, stop, right where I saw this thing in between the two trees. He was retracing his steps. He was facing the exact opposite direction that this thing was going. Clearly, it was not the same thing. And I got to tell you, it literally took me a good 12 hours to process this in my brain. And for Daryl and Brad to just kind of rationalize out the steps, it's, look, I didn't have my rifle. My arms couldn't swing. It's rocky. It's rough down there. You've been down there. This thing was walking like it was on flat ground, very effortlessly. So it was just this constant process for literally 12 hours. And I had to sleep on it. It was anticlimactic because I literally had programmed myself and expected to see this patty thing. And, 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 then, and then afterwards, I tried to, to get a better description so I could tell people about it. What, what came to mind was, uh, I remember a drawing, a sketch from one of the, the I think it was from, from uh, uh, Green's book, The Apes Among Us. I think that's where I first saw it, but it was an old sketch of Jacko. For some reason, my mind went to that sketch, and I thought, that's what I saw. Jacko being a, a, a purportedly, a supposedly a, a young ape that was captured by a train crew in British Columbia a whole long time ago. But in your mind, that's what it seemed like to you. Correct, correct. Again, it's taken me a while, to, and even today, it's almost like the, the collective experience of this group and individuals of this group over the past several years and the integrity and the friendships and the bonds that I've made with these people and their, their collective experience of this animal far overshadows my own visual experience to, to the faith I have in, in the existence of this, this animal. In other words, it, it didn't take this visual to convince me. I'm more convinced by their experiences alone, just by what I saw, because it was just so not what I expected. I didn't see what you saw, but I saw something too last year. And what was interesting to me is what you're saying resonates with me because you wait. Because if you go out looking for Bigfoot, you're trying to see one. That's the big prize. But then what I found after I saw it and what I hear you saying is you say, no, that's what it was. It is like your life isn't different when it's over. It, it, you, you just you just keep going. You just keep looking. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but you expect that once you get this prize, so to speak, something's going to be different afterwards, but it's not really. No, because you already think that they exist. You already, I hate to use the word belief. I don't believe in Bigfoot. I know in Bigfoot. And you already have that knowledge. And then when you see one, it's, oh, yeah, 
And I do believe that what I saw was a juvenile or a young adult male only based on the experiences of others. I happen to think he's one particular individual that we've seen numerous times now after hearing all the stories, especially because of the location where it was. It, it took me a good long while to process all that out in my own head to come to those conclusions. Of course, I got ribbed by everybody. How come you didn't shoot it? Huh, huh, huh. And I deserve that. Yeah, you do deserve that because that's one of the first things you say to people when they have a sighting. But anyway, I won't anymore because I get it now. It's because I wasn't mentally prepared, and had I been prepared, if I actually had my rifle at the ready, I'm very confident I could have taken a shot and had a, a reasonably high expectation of success of hitting it based on my own experiences and my own confidence and my abilities. But at the time, I thought there were people downrange. I thought there were team members, at a minimum Daryl, but I thought maybe Brad McAndrews had been down there as well. I just was not in the right frame of mind in the context wasn't even correct. I was still in slow-mo. I just literally got out of my, my fuzzy slippers. I don't, I don't know that it's a shot anybody would have taken not knowing where our guys were because our guys were in that area. So it was it was not a shot that anyone would have taken, I don't think. But yeah, I, I do want to know why I didn't shoot it. That's why, because I thought I was seeing a person. But as your mind processes it, as it's happening, it's almost like your body can't catch up to the reality of what's going on the ground and your brain is trying to process something that isn't supposed to exist. Absolutely. Your brain is, is trying to fill in blanks that don't have blanks. Sure. There's no reality there to base it on. So many of the people that I've spoken to in this group who had their first sighting, and the sighting goes by, and their brain keeps trying to shove this peg into different holes, trying to make it fit. And by the time you realize that it's this other hole over here, it's all over. But it, you're still trying to process it the entire time. It took me 12 hours to fill that hole, eventually. And that's a great analogy. It's like my brain was trying to pigeonhole something that it had never had to do before. And it was long after the thing was gone. So you can forget about taking a shot. And I'm okay with that because it wouldn't have been a safe uh, situation anyway. I'm still shocked at how it all went down. And I told people in the group and I've told people on the forum, our own forum, that, look, you got to be prepared. You got to be mentally prepared for something you're not expecting because I expected Patty and I did not see Patty. I saw Jacko, you know. And I was not at all prepared for that. But I'm firmly convinced that I saw Wood Ape. I know I did. So now I'm with two of the members of the NAWAC who spent quite a bit of time in the Overwatch tent. Can you guys introduce yourselves? I'm Brad McAndrews. And I'm Jordan Horseman. So you guys, Brad, you were in there quite a bit, but there was also times you were in there together. So we're just going to basically talk about the general you know, notable activities that you experienced while you were in there. Brad, I was there during Bravo Team when you were there during Bravo Team. One morning, because it, it was early in the morning, but it was definitely morning, some interesting things happened. Can you just walk me through those? Sure. The one event I think you're talking about happened during the second week on site, which we call Bravo Team. The first two weeks we had almost every other day, just bad weather, very cold. The night in question was probably our fourth night in the Overwatch, I believe that's right, during Bravo. All night long completely dead quiet. For all intents and purposes, it was quiet all week long, almost a week and a half at this point. No events all night long and right around 6.15 after the sun was probably just rising at that point, but it had been light for approximately an hour. I was in the uh, Overwatch tent with uh, Jeff Eldringham. He was actually racked out on me. Uh, we took some shifts and he was racked out for about 30 minutes. I was cold. It was actually not too unlike how cold it is in this room right now. It's very well air conditioned here. Yeah, it was in the upper 30s, maybe lower 40s. Um, I had a wool blanket around me and I was actually sitting down. What we would do every 15 minutes, we sit down, we listen. You get up and even if you didn't hear anything, you'd get up and you'd scan 3-6 with the, with the rifle and the, the thermal optic. That was our clockwork. We did that all night long. About Right about 6.15, I heard some sounds. So I stood up from my chair very quietly, uh, put the rifle on the tripod and started scanning. Did a, a quick 360. I immediately saw two of the resident foxes, basically a little bit to my northeast, but between the base camp and the Overwatch tent. So I just went right past them because we see them all the time. Did a 360. I didn't see anything, so it must have been them. So I was just watching them because I was bored at 6.15 in the morning. And we were planning on being there till 9 a.m. And while I'm watching them through the optic, all of a sudden I start to hear this. It's just a racket. It's extremely loud. It sounds... The best way to describe it, it's actually louder than this, but would be like taking rebar, metal on metal, like rebar across corrugated tin over and over, wrapping back and forth. Very loud, very caustic sound. And I was thinking in a split second, maybe three, four, five seconds, I'm thinking, what in the heck is this? 
is one of our guys got out of the cabin? Are they making a racket and I can't hear them? What is this? And these thoughts are very fluid in my mind. Of course, when I'm watching these foxes, they go to attention. They both go from eating some of our chow that we put on these big rocks and they look directly in that direction of the sound, which happened to be to the immediate west of the cabin, to my northwest. Interesting to me about this is it's right outside the window in which I was sleeping, but I did not hear a th But it was loud enough. I trust it was very loud, but I slept right through it, which is awesome. But you know how we can sleep out there sometimes yeah, after those long days. You're exhausted. So anyhow, I I'm still watching these foxes. This very loud metal sound happens. They alert to it. I have still eyes on the foxes. I hadn't even thought to swing the rifle in that direction yet. While I'm still watching the foxes, I hear a whoop, maybe without the P sound, uh, but it, it was a moderate. It wasn't quiet. It wasn't extremely loud. It was like, like a exaltation of emotion, just like a whoop. And I was like, I was thinking that's an ape. Holy crap. I swung my rifle towards the, the sound where I, I was hearing it come from. So I swung my rifle in that direction and lo and behold, there's Brian Brown's truck. It's a really nice truck though, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty. And it's real big. So I'm looking in this direction. I'm biting my lip. Of course, I'm just... You're cursing me. You're like, God, parked his damn truck right there. It's hard to believe that this is actually happening, but it's, it's a whoop. I know what I heard. I've got two five-hour energies and a pint full of coffee. I'm awake. This racket keeps on going. This racket goes for 20, 30 seconds before I hear any other sound. In between there, I heard an agitated fox, which we now strongly believe is an ape. A fox is agitated or like it was fighting something, and it sounded like it ran up the North Mountain. And at that point in time, it stopped and then it started again. Then it started to vocalize what everyone refers to as chatter, almost like a disgruntled, very extremely deep sound to it. So essentially what is referred to as the samurai chatter. Several of us have heard it over the years. We recorded it a couple of years ago. Uh, are you familiar with the Sierra sounds? I wouldn't say it's directly the same, but it's pretty darn close. And to hear it at this volume and depth is something else. So when I was listening to this, I was like, I can't believe this is actually happening. Much less after the whoop, this vocal that I'm listening to, and I'm not talking about a quick vocal, I'm talking 20, 30 seconds worth of it. I can't believe what I'm hearing. My partner's asleep. I can't see it, so I can't get a shot off. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm gonna put this rifle down, I'm gonna grab my lever gun, I'm gonna get out of this thing while it's making a racket, while it's being loud, and I'm gonna run at it. My lever gun is not in the tent with me. I just didn't think about it at the time. So I'm in there without it. So this a fascinating thing's happening and it's still vocalizing. So I turn to Jeff who's racked out and I'm shaking him violently. He's not waking up. So I, I slap him on the face pretty good for four or five times or more. That didn't wake him up. So I, I knocked him twice. I'm surprised he never said anything about it, but I, I knocked him pretty good. He woke up and I was just like, shh. He sat up. He listened to it for 10 or 15 seconds. Clearly. So anyways, when it was doing this, it actually mo it sound it sounded to me as if it was moving to its west and then to the south where I might be able to hear it. Of course, I'm taking my eyes off because I'm lifting a seven pound rifle with an optic on it to the direction on a tripod and looking back to him trying to get his attention. So I'm back and forth and I'm trying to get my eyes on it, but I can't see anything. So I'm a little bit defenseless, but in a nutshell, that's what happened. And, and it dispersed after that, nothing more. Well, that's basically the the punctuation at the end of a very uneventful night. How long does one of these shifts usually last when you guys are in there? It depends on how long we were up the night before. I'd say anywhere from as early as 22.30 to maybe 2 a.m. the next morning, we would start. Earlier in the summer, I started to try to stay in there until 9, 9.30 a.m. just so that it looked like we literally are sleeping in there. Later on in the summer during Juliet, you're in there and these just fantastic things are happening because everything accelerated as the summer got warmer and the foliage bloomed and things would happen in the morning and we're just itching at the bit. So sometimes it'd be 730 and I had to get out of that tent and chase after something. That's just natural. It's not stir crazy. It's just that you want to capitalize on something and enough is enough. You, you do understand? There were times during Juliet where my partner, Jordan Horseman, was in the overwatch with me. The first night we were in there, as soon as everybody racked out and went in the cabin, we had animals coming down from North Mountain starting to encircle us. You can hear them moving very loudly. And we had a rock. It was a rock and it was hurled fast and it came in sideways and you could hear it coming straight at us and hit the accordion cross beam in that sideways. It didn't, it wasn't a nut falling out of a tree. This is maybe a baseball to a half a baseball size, pretty good rock hitting us sideways. There was a huff 
And The Rock came in just as you said. It was absolutely unnerving. Jordan, how many times had you done Overwatch up to this point? That was the second night. Relatively soon. And how many times had you been down into Area X at this point? That was the very first time I'd been in X. The very first time you get a huff and a rock thrown at your head, basically, <laughs> inside the tent. As a relative newcomer to the situation, after hearing a lot of stories, what are you thinking at this point? Before that, you're thinking, can I possibly bring an outsider's perspective to perhaps, sometimes we hear things that sound like apes, but everyone knows they're barred owls. Maybe there's something for other things that are attributed to apes. So your mind's desperately trying to come up with reasonable ideas, and then something like that happens, and you cannot lie to yourself anymore. You, it's immediately recognizable what it is, and it's shocking. I know you guys had some really interesting experiences with rocks over the time that you're in there, but this particular rock we're talking about that hit the side of the tent, how far do you think it traveled? It's hard to judge. It definitely was not far away. 30 yards, maybe. It wasn't yeah. very far. Yeah. But it came from a direction where we had large animal movement. And, and sounds. And, and sounds. <laughs> but that's cupcakes compared to what happened that week. So <laughs> later on in that same week, you heard some much more significant rocks being thrown from, from a distance. Can you, can you just tell me what happened? This was much later in the week. Probably uh, the fourth night we were in there, yeah, I believe. Yeah, about the fourth night. It was later in the night, probably around four in the morning. I think our field notes say this took place between about maybe 3.15. And I, yeah. this has been a while since I've been there and looked at these notes. Maybe 3.15 in the morning to about 4 a.m. We had heard a, quite a, a normal amount of wildlife. It wasn't a very quiet night, but uh, taking notes and we heard some rock throws that, that were definitely... Unique. We, we were a little dumbfounded by this one. It, we wouldn't learn really what what caused these sounds until uh, uh, 20 minutes later after the first sound that we heard. So just picture this. You are in a 8x8 eight eight black tent where you cannot see, you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. Uh, you heard Daryl talk about it earlier. When you were in this environment, we had one chair and a tripod uh, with a rifle various batteries, some other facilities, right? And you have, you have your, your scopes. We had a monocular and, and a rifle scope. You have to create a mental map in this environment to, to look at things. So everything, all your senses are focused on your sight is gone, feeling's gone. Your sense of smell is retarded because you are in an enclosed environment. It was like a trash bag in there. <laughs> your sense of sound, you were lying very heavily on it. The more time that you spend in that type of environment, you can start to triangulate different sounds and get an idea of depth, distance, speed, those kinds of things. So this particular night that we're talking about, we heard, and this is what we wrote in the field notes, what sounded like a series of wood knocks in very quick succession of one another over a, in, in a linear type of vector, right? From the northeast of our location, maybe about 55, 60 yards, I'd, I'd estimate, from the main cabin, or in the direction of the cabin and past the cabin, a series of four or five it sounded like wood knocks, clean wood knocks, no other secondary sounds. Four or five over what period of time? Very short. Two or three seconds max. Real quick, but but you could sense that they had, they were moving along. It was, very yeah, it was from it was, one side to the next directly. So to the LA person's ear or, or whatever you want to call us, big footers or whatever. Anybody listening to this stuff out in the woods, listening to noises and trying to apply it to something, it sounded like wood knocks, right? And I don't really like to use the word wood knock. They're just audible signals to me, right? You, you don't really know what's producing these things. But it sounded like a series of four or five wood knocks over a period of two to three seconds in a distance of about probably 120 yards. So I just wrote that down and I said, this makes absolutely no sense. I cannot accept that this is multiple animals making these sounds in quick succession to one. Right? It doesn't make sense and I cannot accept it. But that's a football field, including the end zones. Right. And they're not doing the wave. Right. So what is it? So 15, 20 minutes later, we are still in there. We have already talked us, whispered this over, and we filled out our field notes in our journal, wrote down our thoughts. And then we had, from that same original direction, what was absolutely a rock throw, and a tremendous rock throw that started from that same location that was northeast of us. But this came to the south and surpassed where we were in the Overwatch, I would guess anywhere from 70 to 80 yards. And we're talking... A, a very large rock just tearing the foliage, the limbs. You're hearing knocking sounds like wood knocks, but this time we can hear foliage. We can hear everything. We hear the rock impact the ground. It was tremendous. And we looked at each other, Jordan and I, and we're thinking, I was like, oh my God. Because here's the deal, <laughs> right? I've was, been... that, was the first, that was the most unnerved I was there because it was the only time I was out there when I realized that Brad was unnerved. 
So once I realized that Brad was unnerved, I said, okay, all these other times I was getting a little nervous. He seemed to think it was everyday sort of stuff. I have heard literally hundreds and hundreds of rocks being thrown. Right. Nothing like this. Before we could even, like we were mid-sentence talking. We were whispering, but we were unnerved. And mid quote unquote sentence, we heard another one. And this comes from our Southwest. The opposite direction, different yeah, direction. Slowly, uh, the origination was much further away. I'd say at minimum 60 yards, at minimum. And when it first started, we could hear it and it made us stop whispering to one another. And it was distant, it was quiet, but you could hear it ripping foliage and limbs. And it was very loud, it was producing knocking sounds. It was so fast, ripped through all, it was basically coming our direction. I think I ducked. Literally, we, I thought it was coming right at us. It sounded like it was I not mean, thrown, but just literally launched it was like by something. It was like a mortar. Literally, that's literally. the best analogy that I can come up with. Then there was this pause. And then just a couple of seconds later, a half second later, just a tremendous impact on the roof of the main cabin. Just like a cannon. The, loud, the loudest I've heard by far. And I've experienced a lot of things in this valley. This is the only time that I've actually considered retreating into the cabin. It was completely unnerving. That should say something to you that a, a rock being thrown, listening to something like that could influence me like this. When you're presented with this display of force, this display of power, right? They're not overly aggressive animals most of the time. And then all of a sudden they do something that just demonstrates this huge amount of strength. And you're just like, holy God, I'm small, you're, right? You're in absolute awe of what took place. I'm still in awe of what took place. Now, do you think that was a rock yeah. going through the trees? Is that what you're thinking now? That absolutely had to have been a large rock traveling 120 yards. This thing had to be a softball size. It had maybe bigger. This hit limbs that sounded like wood knocks. When I first heard it, Brad was the one taking notes, and I was thinking, I know this sounds crazy, but do you think that was a rock throw? But I knew I, I was still a rookie. I was first time I was in there, and I was thinking, okay, I don't want to be a fool and mention something that's impossible. You're going to be the guy saying something stupid. I think it just threw a rock 120 yards. It sounds so foolish. Right. And so I had the same thoughts that I had, but nothing was rational. So it was a game of truth chicken. Who's going to really say, it? Did, did you hear what I think I heard? And no, what do you think you heard? It wasn't until the throws that came after we realized, okay, there's confirmation that it's not so insane to believe that's what we originally heard because we just had example after example since. I can't recall ever having had that particular kind of event reported. Though back in 2008, we heard some very large sounds of rocks impacting. We didn't hear them flying through the trees like that. But the, I think this is unique in, in the three years that we've been doing this. Is, is that correct? It was unique until the following team after we left during Kilo, where Derek Collier and Travis Lawrence experienced the same thing. And, and we talked to these guys you just here yesterday that they were like, we believe our partners here. But... That's just so awesome what they're describing. It's hard to fathom. What do you think about that? And then that same night when they were having that discussion, they experienced the exact same thing. Incredible. Was it the same night that you saw something through the thermals or was that a different night? The third night we were in Overwatch. We got in there late because it was Sawbones last night. There really felt like a lot of tension. He really thought something was going to happen. So he stayed up late and we stayed up late with him. He was eliciting a lot of responses from the animals, lots of rock throws, but eventually he decided to retire to the cabin and we got into Overwatch. It wasn't long that we were in there and we had heard things up on the mountain the whole time, but we couldn't see anything. When we finally got in Overwatch, we both were scanning. We heard l large animals up on the mountain and we looked up and you could see white. You could see something on there, but it was White is what it looks like through the thermal. What yeah. the, the heat is, the, the hotter it is, the whiter it is. There was a hot spot, but you could tell there was multiple hot spots, but you could tell it was being caused by one or maybe two animals, something large, but it was very indistinguishable. Foliage is in the way you might be seeing glimpses of it through the heat through the foliage. Correct. And Brad's on the actual weapon, and the weapon didn't really have as good of a thermal as I had. And I could see this animal, and I knew it was large, but we couldn't really tell what it was. Yeah, so it was indiscernible, it was amorphous, and it was 60 yards away. Yeah. And it was very, it really got my blood pumping to think this could be, is this what, it's a bear or it's something else? But you, you want to err on the side of caution. Next thing we know, we can't see it again. We waited a little while and it seemed rather quiet. So Brad decided he was going to take a few winks and, and rest a little. Again, we got in there late. So even though we hadn't been in the tent that long, it was very late at night. 
as soon as Brad lays down on the cot, he starts to snore like it seems like all of us seem to do as soon as we lay down there. I'm not used to this environment. I'm very nervous. I just saw what I thought could definitely be a strange animal. Best case scenario, it's a bear. I'm definitely trying to be very, trying to make sure I'm not leaving any stone unturned, scanning constantly with the thermal. And I am actually seeing quite a few animals. I'm seeing some small animals, rodents. I, I believe there was a raccoon that was moving around. So I'm definitely seeing wildlife, but nothing out of the ordinary. Stay tuned for more Sasquatch Odyssey. We'll be right back after these messages. The, it seemed like as soon as he started snoring, the whole place got active. No, nothing strange, but just even normal animals that you'd expect, like the raccoons, they weren't moving around until... He, I'm scanning and I'm scanning just to the southwest. There's a pair of trees. I see a hot spot, just like I did on the mountain, but it's very small. Maybe a raccoon, something on the tree. So I focus on it. There's nothing else there. And I'm thinking, what is that? Is that a... And before I can even complete the thought in my head as, is it a raccoon on a tree? It steps out from this tree. I just felt my heart drop into my stomach because it was obvious. Because I was trying so hard just moments before, trying to discern what this anamorphous shape was. And I was, I don't know. And the stark contrast between that shape on the mountain and this clearly knew immediately what this animal was when it stepped out. And I immediately knew, okay, as soon as I saw it stride, you could see it walking. I could see the shoulder movement. I couldn't see clearly below that because of all the foliage, but from the shoulder up, it was clear that this was an upright animal walking down this game trail to our southwest heading across towards the east. So I immediately got Brad up and I remember saying, there's an ape right there. And she's whispering, but it's a loud whisper. Anyhow, he got me up. I'm on point immediately. He, he points in the direction. I have the rifle in that direction. He says, follow the sound. Of course, I'm, I'm having to show him through touch because it's totally pitch black. Can't he see, can't see anything. Can't so see I'm grabbing his hand and trying to point to the southwest corner and saying that's where it is. But of course, at this point, we're probably I'm, being less than silent, but also it's already moving when I saw it. I'm probably on it in two seconds. Once I was conscious, I, I was on it in probably two seconds. It was quick. And this entire time, I have one eye watching this animal walking across, another trying to get him on this animal. I take the thermal down, get them down here. I realize, okay, I was really impressed. About two seconds, he's up, the weapon's on the tripod, and he's in the direction I pointed. But of course, at this point, I'm, I've already watched it travel quite a ways. I'm realizing this weapon is directly to my left, pointing not where it is anymore. I'm trying to fight my clear vision with his fuzzy vision from the thermal and trying to direct him. So I put down my thermal and I, as soon as I did, I said, it's traveling this way. Of course, at this point, I'm not actually watching what it is. I said, follow the sound, follow this. Can you not hear it? It sounds like footsteps. Originally, that's what I thought. We picked out some waypoints really uh, around the tent, basically to give each other non-visual cues to where to look. And, and he put me on one. I was there in two seconds. I couldn't see anything. And when you're saying follow the sound, I, I, I followed the sound and I was going further away from the southwest to directly do south. I threw a rifle closer to the ground because I couldn't see anything. And I see two armadillos. I'm like, Jordan, it's an armadillo, man. And I immediately think, like I was saying, are you sure? I, did I really misidentify an armadillo? I get back on the thermal. I'm looking around. The animal I was watching is gone. I still hear the sound. But that sound I'm associating with the large animal I just saw, why wouldn't I? And I also look down, I see those armadillos. That is not what I was looking for. That was all lost in translation. It's difficult environment. It's, it's my new black. partner. You're, right. you're, you're pitch black. You're deeply asleep. And two seconds later, you're awake and you're supposed to be like sighting this thing in. I'm surprised that you even could get him up, let alone that you I, could function. I have to look back and say just how quickly this guy's he's awesome. He's a good partner. And we had great communication and we were on it. And it just wasn't time. It just wasn't the time. And those things happen has happened to a number of us. The interesting part, and I'll let you talk to this, uh, that next morning we went in to replay this to try to get a better idea because I believed what he saw, but we we went over it because while we're sitting in the tent at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., we're not going to hash it out while we're in there. We have a job to do. So the next morning, I'll let you take that, Jordan. The next morning, we were trying to determine exactly where it was that I saw. It, it is rather disorienting to look through a scope. It's basically projecting it 
a computer image of what's in front of you. So it's not one to one. It's not like looking through just a circle. It's the scale's a little different and it's pitch black. At this time, I'm thinking, I know for sure what I saw was what I saw. I was like, I'm really, I need to find where it was. And so when I did, I had Brad go out to where I saw it. And he's thinking, here? And I said, no, it's further east. And when he got to that pair of trees that I saw, he poked out a little bit. And I was watching him on the thermal. And I said, oh my gosh. One, because that is a mirror of what I saw. But the main difference is, I had no clue until I saw Brad in the same position. The size of that animal was so much larger than it originally appeared to me. When I had the sense of scale, okay, so there's Brad. I know his size. I thought that it was a relatively smaller. How big do you think it got? What did we determine? Over seven feet. It was more like, it was closer to eight. Seven and a half. Minimum seven and a half feet. Interesting, and this is going to tie into what Travis is going to say in a little bit, but that area where you saw this thing walk out of was if people remember the the last episode I did on, on Area X, we had perceived motion behind my truck. And this time it was parked in a different spot, not where it would obscure Overwatch anymore, but it, but perceived over the course of that week, activity back there, I heard something step in there. And this is where you saw this thing walk out of same area. Your first sighting, right? Definitely the first visual. I still have never seen one with my plain eye, but as soon as I saw him in the same place, my heart dropped all over again. And it was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe, it's unbelievable. My brain was still trying to accept the images that was sent to it. It, There's no way, and yet there's proof that what I saw was a large animal. So I'm talking to uh, Alton again, and uh, Travis this time, and this is an event that, this is pretty much the reason why we know that at some point Overwatch is going to work. Alton, you are a bit player in this story, but uh, you were also the catalyst of what happened. I'm going to ask Travis to explain to him the the situation. You'd been in Overwatch at this point. Uh, you'd been there for for a little while. What time of the morning did this occur? It occurred at 3:50 a.m. Let me preface this by saying we've long known that these apes like to approach tents. We've had other experiences that have been talked about here on this show with Daryl and Alton in the Big Thicket, where one of these animals approached their tent. And we have many sighting reports of these animals approaching tents. It's just something they do. We decided to try something where Alton would sleep out in a tent and we could watch over him from the overwatch. During this time, occasionally whenever he would wake up during the night, he would turn his light on and he would play with the zipper on his tent, things like that. We could see him turn the light on from inside the overwatch tent because it's very thin plastic that's going around it. A week before this incident that we're talking about, I was in the Overwatch tent with Daryl. We saw Alton's light come on. So naturally, as soon as his light comes on, what we would do is scan around with the thermal because we're thinking if there's an ape nearby, maybe it would start moving because he would scare it away or maybe it would want to get a better look at him. I don't know. That's a natural time to scan. During this time, I saw a big heat signature not far from his tent. It's 15, 20 yards away. It was obviously a large animal, but I didn't see enough of it to identify what it was. And I just saw a piece of it in the brush, maybe five seconds, then it was gone. I could tell that it was a large animal based on what I saw, but I couldn't identify what it was because I couldn't see enough of it. It was obscured by brush. I want to stop for a second and say that where Alton, where your tent was in this area that Jordan had seen the animal step out of, it was where during Foxtrot, I had heard something step back in there and a few of the other members of that team had seen eye shine in that area. We're really quite confident that this particular area right where your tent was is an area where they have been possibly observing us you're in your tent at this point just tell me from your perspective what happened i was in area x this summer 31 days the vast majority of those nights i slept in the tent about 100 feet away from the cabin and on this particular night i remember when i'd entered the tent i heard some rock movement, rustling sounds, not super loud, but real distinctive rock movement sounds from the little road that is not far away, just 20 feet or so away. And I thought it was Travis, or maybe over there. I didn't call out to them. I, I almost did. I almost called out, what are you guys doing over there? But I didn't say anything. Later found out that it wasn't them. So in retrospect, I was thinking that not long after I'd entered my tent, maybe one of these creatures had come over. Because this area, like you said, we've had over the years, over the summers, the last few years, uh, several sightings in that area. 
So that was the idea. I was going to sleep in my tent and see if that would attract them periodically through the night because I snore when I sleep and we were thinking maybe that might serve as an attractant. Through the night, periodically, I would run my zipper back and forth because it makes a pretty loud noise. I turn on my light, stir around a little bit just to see if that would instigate my movement. On this particular night, it was about 3.50, I think Travis said, and I was doing that, and that's when he saw something. So you had first seen some large heat signature. Did you ever get a better look at what was in there? Yeah, I did. So I saw a heat signature back in the same area the week before this happened. So every time Alton would get up, and and I've been doing Overwatch every night ever since then, six, seven days later, and I would always check this one area. There's a a little clearing back in the brush where it just looks like large animals move through and things like that. And every time Alton would get up, I would make sure I checked that spot. This time I checked that spot. I saw movement of something like a large animal back in the brush in there. I couldn't tell what it was. It was up very high is what I could see. I wasn't sure what it was. And I was in the Overwatch tent with a guy named Robert Taylor. As soon as Alton turned his light on, I would always say, Robert, okay, scan around. As soon as Alton turned his light on, I said, shit, Robert, there's an ape back there to the side of Alton back where it was before. Robert had a handheld thermal. I had the rifle. He was training on that area, and he said he couldn't see anything in there. And I was like, I I just saw a flash of a big animal back there. As soon as Alton's light came on, like it scared it or something, like it stood up if it was standing back there. I don't know. I said, there's a big animal back there. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's an ape because of how big it was. About that time, Alton started playing with the, the zipper on his tent. He still had his light on, and I was still staring back in this area. And back in this exact same spot, I saw a head and shoulders come up in the foliage. I got to tell you, doing this in the Overwatch with acting like a human bait with Alton, safety is of the utmost importance to us. I was nervous about doing this because you have the questions about shooting something that you can't actually see details of. All you can see is a white heat signature of it. And I got to tell you, as soon as I saw this thing, it it looked nothing like Alton. When you look at a human, you can see their clothes, you can see their facial hair, you can see their hairline of where their skin starts, where their hair ends. With this quality thermal that we've got, it's an ATM Thor, and it's very good quality. I saw this thing. All I could see was white heat signature. I couldn't see any any dark spaces where maybe there was skin or something, but just the shape of it, there was nothing human-like about it. Of this head and shoulders sort of appeared in the foliage. So... I couldn't tell how big it was, but it's just as soon as I saw it, I knew exactly what I was looking at. And within one second of seeing it, I put the crosshairs right on this sucker's nose and I squeezed the trigger. So I fired and I wasn't facing exactly towards where it was because it didn't come out exactly where I thought it would. I was facing a different direction. I shot it maybe like my eight o'clock, something like that. And I didn't have the rifle exactly straight on my shoulder because I couldn't from that position. And whenever I shot, the scope came back and hit me in the head. I felt like a total noob because I got the scope. So the thermal blinked off as soon as I shot because it hit me in the head. So my next thought was I got to get the thermal back on so I can see what's going on outside because I'm just sitting in the black now. So I turned, I I knew exactly what it was as soon as I I saw it, even though it's a humanoid kind of shape. So that's what makes you nervous about doing something like this inside the Overwatch. You can't see color and things like that whenever you're looking through a thermal. But as soon as I saw this thing, just the sheer shape of it, there's not a human on earth that has this shape. It had shoulders that, in later comparisons, I could tell that it was very big, very broad. I couldn't tell that at the time because it was all I could see. But the top of the head was about as high as it would be on a human, except the head was squished down. There was no neck at all. And the head was uh, conical. It was come to a pointy top. And the most significant feature that really stood out to me was the trapezius muscles on the side of this thing's neck, or lack of neck, whatever you want to call it. It looked like these muscles came out from about the area of the ear and attached to the middle of its shoulder, if that makes any sense at all. There's a picture on our website by Pete Travers. It says Northern Sasquatch, Southern Sasquatch person, something like that. And it's very similar to his drawing. I guess he just got that drawing from eyewitness reports. But it had these huge trapezius muscles that connected from his ear to the middle of his shoulder and his head was pointy on top. Like I said, his head, the top of his head would be about proportional to where a human was, but his chin would be lower because he has a conically shaped head. So it just, it, it, there was nothing human about the way it looked whenever I saw it. Point, you've taken your shot at this classic Bigfoot shape. Your scope has gone off. What do you think has happened at this point? What is going through your mind? My first thought was, I just did it. I told Robert. Robert actually, from his position, he couldn't see it. The foliage was in the way. 
from what I remember, I could see about chest up, and it seemed like all that was clear. I don't remember seeing any foliage in front of him, but you can't pick up real fine foliage through the thermal. My first thought was, I just did it. And Robert was confused because he's, I couldn't see anything. And you just shot. So I told Robert, I said, I swear to you, there was an ape over there. I saw it very clearly. I think we just did it, man. I think it's over because this thing was about 30, 35 yards from me. I was right on it. I have a lot of experience as a hunter and I don't take shots unless I'm 100% positive that I'm going to take an animal. Not to brag on myself, but I'm batting a thousand when it comes to deer hunting, except for one incident. That wasn't my fault because the scope was off. But I've killed like 50 deer in my life, and I've never lost one. I'm very careful about my shots. I've not taken shots before because I didn't have the shot and lost good deer because of it. That's the kind of hunter I am, though. I'm very careful about my shots, and I was right on this sucker's nose, and it was shooting a fish in a barrel. It was just right there. I was 100% positive that I was right on him. I had a good trigger squeeze. I didn't jerk, anything like that. It happens so fast. You know, you get something that a, a non-hunter would not be familiar with is an adrenaline rush to the call buck fever. You know, as soon as you see a big buck or something, your heart rate raises and things like that. And, and you start shaking if you look at an animal too long before you shoot it. This happens so fast. You know, as soon as a head came up, uh, I pulled the trigger. It happened so fast that I didn't even get the adrenaline rush before the shot. So I wasn't even shaking until after the shot. After the shot, I was trying to talk to Robert, and he was like, just breathe, man, because I, I thought that I'd just done it. I thought that we had achieved our goal, our present goal. They actually waited for a while, and Robert instructed me. I was in my tent, and Robert instructed me to go to the cabin. We actually forgot about Alton for a minute. I hollered at them. I said something. I don't remember what I said, but what's going on or whatever. Robert told me to go to the cabin, get Mark, who slept through the whole thing. So I ran back to the cabin, and we waited a little while, I don't know, five minutes or more. Then we went looking for it, and Travis was confident. He was a hundred percent confident that, that he had shot one. So you walk over there and what, what'd you find? Yeah. And I was also a hundred percent confident that it would be piled up in a heap over there because this wasn't the type of shot where you go, let me see if I can find some blood so I can find a trail. No, I was aiming at the sucker's nose because I didn't want him to run anywhere. I didn't know how big he was. And he was fairly close to the cabin area where we could have just drug him out. I, I wanted him to, to drop right there and be dead. I was positive that's what was going to happen. We gave it about 30 minutes, I think, give or take. I don't know, something like that. You always wait a little bit before you follow up on an, on an animal because the last thing you want to walk up on is a wounded animal. Even worse than that is a, a wounded ape of some sort that weighs like 800 pounds. That, that doesn't sound like fun at all, right? But just by the off chance, he wasn't dead. We wanted to give him enough time. So we gave him about 30 minutes. It was probably about 415, 420, something like that. We walked over in the woods, right where it was, started shining the lights around. I actually went back to the cabin. We discussed our plan of action. We have a sort of a burlap tarp that we were going to drape over it because we have some contingencies, some questions that we don't know how the other apes are going to react whenever we put one on the ground. So our plan was to cover it up with this burlap tarp so that if there are any other apes that can see what we're doing, they won't know what we're doing because they can't see this member of their clan or whatever, their troop. All of the contingency plans that we've established, you guys are putting into motion at this point. You're about to execute the plan. Yeah, we are about to execute our plan exactly as we planned it. I went back to the cabin. I switched out the thermal scope to rifle with my 4570 with my flashlight mounted on it. We went over to the woods where it was. Much to my surprise, there was nothing there. That didn't make sense to me at all. I, I was very confused about that. I went back to the Overwatch tent and I looked back where Alton's tent was and back where this thing was off to the side. And I was like, yeah, I'm positive it was right back there. I couldn't understand why it wasn't dead back there because I knew that I was right on it. So I was like, maybe somehow that thermal scope, maybe the zero got knocked off on it. Or we'd shot it like maybe a week earlier and it was dead on. Sometimes things happen, scopes get bumped and they get knocked off. But I didn't know what had happened, how I'd missed this thing. It, it seemed like so unlikely that the scope would get bumped because I'd, I was the one that had been controlling it. And I knew that I hadn't dropped it or anything like that. So it didn't make any sense to me how this ape wasn't dead back there. And going back there, I realized it was a little bit back in the brush because it was obscured. We looked for 10 minutes. Mark is with us, and he has a lot of experience hunting and tracking and things like that, too. He said, he, he pretty much called it. He said, look, dude, there's too much stuff back here between the ape and the edge of the clearing, sort of bet between you and the ape. He said, you probably hit a twig or something and, and it deflected the bullet. He said, sometimes you can hit a twig and it can come off at a 40 degree angle and you probably missed it totally. And I wasn't satisfied with that because like I said, I couldn't see any foliage between 
me and the ape, other than what was obscuring his lower portions. Travis thought maybe the plastic could cause the bullet to sure. deform or something. So we tested that out the next morning. To that point, we had not shot through the plastic, and it's it's possible that, that, that even that small amount would really change the ballistics of a projectile. But uh, you tested that the next morning. That wasn't the problem. You, you were still dead on through the plastic. Yeah, we did. Before we even tried this Overwatch idea, I knew that we needed to test shooting through the plastic, but we just forgot about it because we got so much other stuff going on. So that was our bad for forgetting to, to test shooting through the plastic and making sure that the bullet wouldn't mushroom as soon as it hit the plastic or deflect off in some direction. And we did test it the next morning and found out that I, I hit a can at 40 yards on my first shot. Stay tuned for more Sasquatch Odyssey. We'll be right back after these messages. So it was a little bit farther away than where this animal was. So I knew that the gun was on and that there wasn't any problem shooting through plastic. I knew that the bullet wouldn't mushroom going through plastic because the entrance hole into the can was the same diameter as the bullet that I shot. It was a 30 6 But we didn't find anything that night, like I said. Mark said, let's just wait till morning, wait till it gets daylight. It's only like another hour or so till daylight. So I was very upset because I just couldn't understand what happened because I knew that I was right on this thing. I knew I had a good trigger pull and somehow this thing wasn't dead over there. I was very upset about that. A lot of this sounds to me like the the so-called echo incident from Operation Endurance when Daryl had his shot. In my speaking to him, he's saying a lot of the same things you're saying right now. You expected there to be a pile of dead animal over there and there wasn't and it was really pissing you off. Yeah, it was... Not not so much pissing me off, but just confusing because I wasn't mad. Like, I didn't feel like I'd screwed up or right. I didn't feel like maybe I missed. I just didn't understand because I felt like I was right on it. Mark kept saying, let's just go back in the cabin and wait till daylight. I was out there by myself. I was like, I know this thing got to be back here somewhere. I was like, maybe it wasn't standing where I thought it was. I don't know. So, but I, I just kept looking for it. And then I just, I realized that we weren't going to find this thing. It had gotten away. Obviously, I'd missed it and I couldn't account for that. Everybody else just went to bed. I was like, I'm not going to bed. I'm all keyed up now. I'm all, I was like, I'm not going to bed. And I just, you know, something we do sometimes is just go yell at the mountainside, yell at the apes, to just right. kind of vent. And I walked behind the cabin and I don't even think I was yelling. I was just talking. And I just told the apes that I said something like, I, I had you, I saw you and I had you and you got touched by an angel because I was on you and somehow you got away. And I don't know. Eventually, 30 minutes later, my adrenaline rush wore off and I went ahead and fell asleep, probably six o'clock or something like that. I got back up a couple hours later. All of us went back to the area of where this happened. We found a, a twig right on the edge of the brush, maybe six or seven, eight yards from where the ape was standing. We found a twig that was broken and it's a little twig. It's like half the size of my pinky finger, but it was snapped off and it was just hanging there by a thread. And Mark went up to it and he twisted it around uh, to its initial position and folded it back up on the tree And you could see this little half circle cup shape on the top of this twig where obviously the bullet had struck this twig and it cut a little cup shape through it. About four or five feet behind this twig, there was another twig that was a little bit bigger. It was the same thing. It was just hanging there. If you picked it back up and reset it in its original position, there was a cup shape on top of that one also. This was maybe like five or six inches higher than the first twig. So as soon as I saw that, I realized immediately what had happened. I had hit a twig right there at the edge of the brush on the top of the twig, and the bullet had deflected upwards because in a distance of five feet, the bullet had risen five or six inches, and then it clipped another twig uh, five feet later, and, and it hit the top of that twig also, and it deflected higher up, and I probably shot two feet over this animal. I was thankful that I knew what had happened. I was thankful that we didn't have a wounded animal out there somewhere. That's the last thing you want is for you to wound one of these things and it run off somewhere and died. That's the worst of all situations. So I was thankful that I didn't hit it, knowing that I didn't hit it. Thankful that now I know what happened. I hit a twig, and we learn from our mistakes. Basically, we're talking about a quarter of an inch, right? This is how big this thing was. A quarter of an inch is what made the difference in this particular case. Before you go on, you guys had done some measurement when you found the twig. What did you find when you took a line from the tent from the hole in the plastic to this twig to try to determine the height of the animal. Yeah, I just, just did some basic math. I, I measured the height. You could see the exit from the Overwatch 10, of course. It actually blown out quite a large area just from the force of the blast, but, but you could see the, the exit hole. I just measured the distance, the height above the ground, the distance to the first twig, 
the height of the twig, the height of the twigs, and went back to where I thought the creature was probably standing. There was an opening back there where we think it was. You can see where things weren't standing or couldn't stand. So there was this opening back there, and so I didn't see any tracks, but I estimated you could see probably the route that it took, the road that I mentioned earlier where I heard some rocks move. On the other side of that's a trail where we're pretty sure that these things traverse. And right immediately across from the road from that trail is where it apparently had entered and found this little area where it was observing my tent. So estimating where it stood in there and estimating the rise of the bullet and then the distance from the twig to where I thought it was standing, I could estimate the height. And I came up with an estimate of over eight feet in height. Feet three inches. Something like that. Fair. And to someone who doesn't know a lot, I've, I've said this before on the show and, and in other places, but people who don't know anything about firearms think that all guns are guns, right? And they're all doing the same thing. But there's many different attributes depending on the kind of, of bullet that you're shooting. Now, why did we choose the kind of round that you were shooting that day? And how do you think it played into what happened here? Like I said, we try to learn from our mistakes here. And our mistake here was that we hit a twig instead of an ape. So we try to think, it was outside of my control because I couldn't see that twig that I shot at, but it's something that I didn't account for ahead of time is what if it's back in the brush somewhere and you hit some brush, your bullet needs to be able to plow through it. Like we've said, we have this thermal mounted on a 30 out six. I carry a 4570 whenever I'm out as my main gun out there, but we have this thermal mounted on a 30 out six because ATN told us that the, the 30 out six was the highest amount of recoil that, that this thermal scope is rated for. So that's the reason we, we got this 30 out six. So it's a little bit weaker, but it's the most powerful thing that we can successfully mount this thermal on, according to ATN. So that's what we did. Basically, what you're saying there is that if we'd used a higher caliber round, a bigger bullet, so to speak, it would have thrown off the sensitive equipment inside the scope. And you only would have had them. It would have been impossible to even sight it because you have to shoot it to sight it. And every time you shoot it, you're throwing it off. Yeah, I don't know if it would have thrown it off or if it would have broken something inside. ATN just told us that they, they wouldn't recommend us putting it on a forty five seventy, so we took their word for it. So we, we mounted it on a thirty out six, and when searching for a round for the thirty out six, I picked out the round, and it was my bad. We just said we want the most powerful round we can get because this is a big animal, and we don't want our choice of round to be the difference between an animal getting away wounded or dying. We chose buffalo bore. A lot of us carry buffalo bore in our pistols and in our long guns. I chose the Barnes Triple Shock Tipped X Bullet. It's a 180 grain round. It flies at about 2,900 feet per second. It's like a 30 out six Magnum. It's a, a Spitzer shaped bullet. It's got a pointed tip, and it's an all copper round that expands to about 60% of its uh, initial diameter. It's made for deep penetration and heavy bones and things like that. I thought that would be the perfect round for our purposes. The, the Barnes Triple Shock is a great bullet, and that's what I chose. In later reflection, I, I didn't account for shooting through heavy brush because that's not something I normally do. If that had been a deer back there, I wouldn't have taken the shot because it wasn't a clear shot and I would have seen that things were in the way. But when you're looking through a thermal, you can't account for that because you can't see it. And we're going to change the bullet that we have in that 30 out 6 I think next time we're going to go with probably a 220 grain bullet that has a rounded tip. The 220 grain bullet in the 30 out 6 I think goes at about 2,400 feet per second, something like that. If you have a bullet that's moving slower, it's going to deflect less whenever it hits things. And also, since the bullet is heavier, the 220 grains, it's going to plow through things and, and not deflect as much. So it's heavier and it's moving slower, so it's not going to deflect as much. The round we had, you can think of it as a little missile. That little bit of a twig interaction was enough to throw it off course. But what we're shooting now is going to be more of a slug, just going to go through that sort of stuff. Yeah, it is going to be a slug, and that's going to be our main setup next summer. Ideally, we'll raise the funds. We can buy another thermal scope. I want to be able to mount it on my 4570. I have a Picatinny rail and an aimpoint scope. I can buy a special mount from the Rue that raises the aimpoint scope, and I can use the thermal in conjunction with it. Use the red dot on my aimpoint, my zero, and just turn it off on the thermal. That way, the, the recoil of the 4570, it'll only be felt once if, if I have to shoot one of these animals if I get that opportunity again. So ideally, that would be our second gun. But the 4570 would be far better than any 30 out 6 round because I can shoot a big 350 grain bullet that's moving at 2,000 feet per second, and it's going to deflect much less. It'll punch right through the foliage without hardly any deflection. Well, as you say, we learn, right? That's what this has all been about. Three years now, we're just learning every time we go out there. And what strikes me is that 
And I said this to Daryl at some point right after this happened, because a sense of disappointment in the group, because it was a very close call. But the positive that I found out it is that now we have come to a point where trying to collect this specimen is like hunting any other animal. We know how we're going to do it. And sometimes the animal, like you said, it gets touched by an angel. Sometimes the luck goes the animal's way and sometimes it doesn't. So it just, to me, it's just opportunity. It, the next time we just need another opportunity to do it again and it's going to happen. I, I appreciate you telling me this is a big deal. So I appreciate you spending time with me and, and just thanks for everything you've done out there. Yeah, I'm doing all I can. And like you said, sometimes the apes do get lucky and much to our chagrin, they, they do seem to get lucky. But you posted something on the forum the other day and it was a quote that said, that which is possible is inevitable. I think that was the quote. It's just a fantastic quote that our goal is possible. I had one of these animals in my reticle. I don't know if many people on earth can say that. I had one in my reticle. I sent around at it. This sort of freak thing happened. I don't know if you call it a freak thing, but Something outside of my control happened and the animal got away. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. We're going to do this. We're going to get opportunities like this again. We're going to stick with it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn from our mistakes. And we're going to hone our skills and, and we're going to try to make sure that doesn't happen again. Next time, hopefully, we'll get our specimen. We all know the lessons of Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. But seriously, that's the way the members of the NAWAC see the question of collecting a specimen. That one animal, the holotype, can serve to protect and extend the existence of all wood apes all across the continent. Their passion in this endeavor is fueled by three years' worth of first-hand experiences and interactions with these animals. As amazing and hard to believe as that may be, there is no doubt among the NAWAC. The apes are real, and they're there. They live in some kind of social group. They're territorial. And as far as the rest of the world is concerned... They're imaginary. They live at the mercy of the clear cutters and the governmental agencies who might only view these animals as administrative headaches were they to be proven. We can't know how many there are in the Washingtons. We can't know how many there are anywhere. But we know, as a group, for a fact, and everyone in the group is committed to the goal of ensuring the rest of the world knows too. I'd like to thank Alton, Daryl, Paul, Brad, Jordan, and Travis for sitting down and sharing experiences with me and, of course, all of you. They say